Oh, it wasn't? Who was it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, let's go ahead and we'll open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that we have another opportunity to open your word and dive right in. And thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity, for safety. Uh, thank you for your blessing of this church and that we can learn together and open our hearts and our understanding that we might grow in you more. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, if you haven't done so, feel free to grab a set of notes in the back there. Um, so last week, just a quick review, we did some work in Ecclesiastes. Um, we mentioned that the author, we believe, is Solomon. And uh, although his name isn't mentioned, he describes himself in several verses in chapter 1. It could be only Solomon. Um, also, we talked about that he probably wrote it in his old age. As he got older, he fell away from the Lord to a certain degree. Well, it sounds like a large degree, actually. He built, built temples to certain idols and that kind of thing for his wives. And so he became kind of, um, well, worldly-minded, I guess you could say. And Ecclesiastes is a result of his uh, worldly-mindedness as he tries, to, he, he tries to find meaning in life apart from God. Do you remember what the key words for Ecclesiastes are? <laughs> Vanity's one. Good. What's that? Yeah, under the sun, right. Under the sun is like 20, 29 times. Vanity is 37 times. We mentioned that when you see the phrase under the sun, you could insert from human perspective if you want to kind of like make sense. So in other words, Solomon is saying, this is what life looks like from a human perspective. That's how he is trying to describe it. And the word vanity uh, is emptiness, is void, it's no profit. Uh, other people have given it different ideas. I've mentioned uh, one of the commentators I like talked about like soap bubbles. You know, the, you know, life is like soap bubbles. That's significant and that long lasting as it were, right? Um, so he tried to find meaning. He tried everything that modern man does. He tried power. He tried pleasure. He tried wealth. The things, the three things that we see people pursuing in our society, and he did it with a gusto. I mean, we're talking about building projects and work, spending seven and 13 years, the temple, his palace. We're talking about magnificent gardens, vineyards, flocks. We're talking about somebody who went all out. We're talking was someone who had such wealth that it says that silver was regarded as nothing in his kingdom. Everything that was significant was made of gold in Solomon's kingdom. So, and, and then he has his wisdom on top of it. He has everything possible to make life worth living, and the result of that is it's all empty. It's all empty. But what was his end game? What was the thing that he concluded toward the end? Yeah, he says, remember God in the days of your youth. So in other words, I mean, paraphrase, don't do what I just did, right? Um, remember God from the moment of your youth on. Um, we talked about Solomon, you know, if you follow Solomon in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, you don't necessarily have to go through the school of hard knocks to learn those things for yourself. There's nothing more depressing than getting to the end of your life and realizing, you know what, I, I've done everything wrong. I mean... Start in the beginning doing things right so that you can do things right during your life. In the end, all that matters is serving God. Okay, so I'm approaching this study today with fear and trepidation. This is a song of songs. This is a book I said I'd never, ever teach. I really did say that. I'll teach any book in the Bible, even Revelation, and here I am. God says, uh, on, on second thoughts, maybe you will. That's fine. So this book is one of the songs of Solomon. In 1 Kings 4, verse 32, it said that Solomon wrote 1,005 songs, of which this is one. So he wrote 1,005 songs, as well as 3,000 plus Proverbs. Both Hebrew and Greek title this book as the Song of Songs, or you could paraphrase that, the best of songs. So this is supposed to be the best there is, uh, at least from ancient history. Historically, it depicts the wooing and wedding of a shepherdess by King Solomon. It also depicts some of the joys and heartaches of wedded love. Solomon's mentioned in verse 1. He's also mentioned in numerous other places throughout the book. So he is, 
he is accepted as being the author. And there's some other indicators, too, that would indicate he's the author. For example, you have royal luxury, military protection, 60 queens, and 80 concubines already. So when you read that, you go, okay, well, there's one more. Anyway, <clears throat> the date and setting, it was considered to be Solomon's first book written when he was younger. So we're looking at approximately 965 B.C., give or take a little bit. So <clears throat> 3,000 years ago. Now, this may have been his first marriage because of love. Now, we mentioned that there's all sorts of queens and concubines. However, a lot of times back in the day, people would ratify treaties and agreements by marrying a member of the royal family of that country. So it could be that this woman that's being spoken of here was Solomon's first real true love. And that's kind of what it might seem like, I guess. Um, the, the setting... Uh, varies from the country, probably a place called Shunem, which was three miles southwest of Galilee, uh, and also goes from there to Jerusalem, back and forth. It is known that Solomon had flocks and vineyards in Shunem. There are three conversationalists here in, this, in, the, in the book of Song of Solomon. Uh, the bride, Solomon, and a chorus. And the chorus is thought to be like women of Jerusalem that would be that would be giving, you know, uh, I guess, chorus during, during a song. Um, most Bibles delineate who is speaking at the time. So if you look in your Bible, when we look at today, you'll probably see in a side note somewhere, bride, bridegroom, and chorus, or women of Jerusalem. So it, it, it delineates who is speaking. And they do that by, by the gender of the word and also the... Uh, uh, you know, the numerous. I mean, if it's, if it's more than one, it's the women of Jerusalem, male, female, etc. We know who is speaking. Theme and purpose. Now, this book has been variously interpreted during the last 2,000 years. Barrels, barrels of ink have been used interpreting this book. This book has been absolutely gone over and over and over again. It's often seen or described, or I might say wished for, as an allegory either describing God and his love for Israel or God or Jesus and his love for the church. Now, I take it at face value for exactly what it says it is. It's, a po it's poetry extolling God's blessing upon married love. It's, it's, it's basically documenting a courtship. It's documenting marriage. It's documenting some things that can kind of, you know, go wrong in marriage. That's, I'm taking it at face value. Um, God designed sexuality and it only becomes sinful when viewed outside of God's protective parameters. It's been suggested that Proverbs is considered logical, Ecclesiastes philosophical, and Song of Solomon as emotional. Christ in the Song of Solomon, well, the church is the bride of Christ. We can't argue with that. So there are, there are comparisons that would apply in the Song of Solomon to the church. But like I said, I really don't think it's meant to be interpreted that way. Now, there was some delay in accepting this book as canonical. Do you remember what other book in the Old Testament that we talked about recently had kind of a hard time being accepted as canonical? Esther, exactly right. Esther was the one that people were going back and forth about, and the reason why was because, well, why? Do you remember? Yeah, God's not mentioned throughout the entire book, and so People went back and forth. How can this be part of the canon? Well, they said the same thing about this book. God is only mentioned once in this book. Um, also, the question of religious value, unusual subject matter. Uh, this book was accepted as part of the canon only about, about 100 A.D. 100 A.D. by the Jewish people. Okay, so this is a, a really late book to be fully integrated and accepted as part of the canon, which really surprised me. For the class, uh, I've chosen to be as discreet as I can be in the selections I choose and how I want to communicate the lesson. And you know, if you look around, you can figure out why I might do that. So if I miss your favorite verses, you don't necessarily have to remind me of them. If there's a couple of verses you go, man, that's really nice, well... Go ahead and talk to your wife about those verses. That's, yeah, that's the way it's going to be. Sorry. Okay. Before we do this, I'm going to read from Proverbs 30. And Proverbs 30, verse 18. 
And these are the words of Agar. Remember Agar we talked about a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, whatever it was. And Agar was a, one, of the, one of the three authors of, of um, Proverbs, along with Lemuel and Solomon. And he, he says in this, past, in, this, in this chapter, there's three things, there's four things. He has, he's kind of a guy of lists. So in Proverbs 30, verse 18, there are three things which are too wonderful for me, four which I do not understand, the way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the middle of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. So looking at those four things, okay, the eagle, the serpent, the ship, and the man with a maid, what's the common denominator among those that, that would be so enthralling to, uh, to uh, Agar? Unknowns and there's power, okay. Other thoughts? <clears throat> Is there clear direction? <clears throat> For the eagle, he might think there's clear direction, but you, you look up at the eagle, where's the eagle going to go? Unless you see a rabbit or something, you have no idea. Ship in the sea, where's the ship going to go? Well, the pilot will have a certain amount of control, but as we talked about in one of Pastor Jason's messages, they wanted to go, the ship with Paul wanted to go this direction, the wind decided to go in this direction, right? So, so sometimes there's an uncertainty in the ship and the sea. They're not quite sure where they're going to go. Uh, also, we see um, the serpent on the rock. You know, which way is he going to go? Same thing with a man with a maid. It's different. Every courtship is different. There's no such thing as a cookie-cutter courtship. Everyone's different. And speaking for the guys, we have no idea what we're doing most of the time. <laughs> you know, I have to say that we're, we're so good to have gracious women who, who can kind of look at our efforts that we make sometimes and the blunders that we make. You know, where you walk out and you go, I can't believe I said that, you know. <laughs> Things like that. And, and our wives at that time were gracious to us and kind because we don't know what we're doing half the time. So anyway, just, and this, we're, we're approaching Song of Solomon that way too. We're going to see something that is it's unique, it's different. So let's start with uh, the first few chapters. Uh, we can see what's called the beginning of love, as it were. So Sol Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4a. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, May he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like purified oil. Therefore, the maidens love you. Draw me after you and let us run together. The king has brought me into his chambers. So this is the introduction from the bride. Fill in the blank. She is what? Say again. Enamored. Okay. Other thoughts? Any other adjectives? Exhilarated, enthralled. You know, she is, she is completely consumed with this. Is there anything more exhilarating than when one falls in love, for real? When that first happens, it's very, it's very exhilarating. I mean, it's intoxicating. But also, it can be a time of worldly temptation where there are temptations because there's a natural progression and we want to go in that natural progression. However, God has set up parameters so that that progression is controlled a certain way. Okay? For example, premarital um, relations are, are not approved by God. Uh, even though the world thinks it's a great idea, our flesh thinks it's a great idea, the devil loves it, but God says no. God has provided parameters. Now, why has God provided these parameters other than to be a cosmic killjoy for us? Why? Bree? Keep us safe. Okay. Let's, let's focus on that, to keep us safe. How does it keep us safe to follow God's direction, his, his plan for sexual purity? Jen? Jen? Okay. Okay. 
Okay, good. So it, it's, we are made emotionally, we are made to connect especially with one person. I mean, you connect with your children very deeply as well, but there's that one person that you connect with different and deeper than any others. So emotionally protects you. People who go through, you know, uh, live-ins, breakups, marriages, breakups, back and forth, back and forth, what does that do to their emotional well-being? It goose them up. You know, it's difficult. Plus, there's all those heartbreaks. Who, uh, who enjoys a breakup, right? It just wrecks you. It destroys you. It just, I don't care if you're a guy or a gal. It really does. So it keeps us safe. It also keeps us safe from, uh, you know, from um, unwed pregnancies, this kind of thing. Keeps us from that. Keeps us from STDs and things of that nature. So it keeps us safe, Bree, in many ways. So that was, that was really good. So that actually... It actually uh, covers most of it, is to keep us safe, and it gives us the idea why. See, now God, because he loves us, he gives us these directives because he wants us to have a full, beneficial life, a life of obedience to him, which is what gives us happiness. Mark, go ahead. Ah, good. Self-control and discipline, good. Exactly right. Okay, being, being um, more others-oriented than self-centered, which is the best way to enter marriage, right? Craig? A depth and security and being one relationship, absolutely. Good, good, good. Nice job, everybody. Appreciate, appreciate the input of that. Also, uh, the number one, um, how could I say this? The number one guarantee of living a life of poverty is to have children out of wedlock. Okay, we're seeing a, an entire culture which does this. And, you know, usually the moms wind up in poverty and the kids are raised in poverty, often raised without a, a male figure. I know in my line of work, I saw the results of that. I know Scott sees the results of that in crime and all the time as well. There's no male figure in the home. So there's all sorts of things. that God's designed things to be done a specific way. And it's not to be a killjoy, it's because... He loves me and you, and he wants our lives to correspond to his word, which is the best way for us to live. Go ahead, Steve. Spit it out. Yes. Yes. Nice. Good job. Appreciate the input, everybody. That's exactly right. Um, so we have this bride. She's exhilarated, intoxicated, etc., by this love, as we tend to be. And now we have in uh, Song of Solomon 1, 4b, the chorus is speaking. We will rejoice in you and be glad. We will ex extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. The chorus speaks in response, and the chorus says, this is wonderful. This is fantastic. And it is wonderful to see people who are in love. It's infectious. <clears throat> My son Justin got married, oh, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago. <laughs> I look at my wife. She, I'm not going to help you. <laughs> at his wedding, one of my other sons was there. His name's Luke, and he zeroed in on one of the gals helping at the wedding. Her name was Jessie. And I mean, within 30 seconds, I and Justin's uh, father-in-law, we realized, oh, look at this. 
So uh, we kind of orchestrated things where they could kind of like uh, rub shoulders. They've been married for 13 years now. But the point is, you could see it, the chemistry, right away. It's like, whoa. And, and even from an onlooker's perspective, this is really cool to see. And I was really delighted, and it's been, it's been great to see them. Um, so even the women who are observing this find joy in it. Chapter 1, verse 5. Again, this is the bride. I am black but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am swarthy, for the sun has burned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They may be caretaker of the vineyards, but I have not taken care of my own vineyard. Tell me, O you, oh you whom my soul loves, where do you pasture your flock? Where do you make it lie down at noon? For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? So, what's caused the problem for her initially in these verses? What do you see there that's been, been a problem? Not necessarily. I'm looking at, I'm looking at um, Bree and over here. What, what do you, what's a major problem in families sometimes, Arthur? Bree? We're not raising the Lord. Peggy? Yeah, you, you two should have got that right away. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Sibling rivalry, right? So there's something going on here. She's done something that made her brothers, there's more than one, uh, upset, and somehow she wound up being sent out to be a caretaker of these particular vineyards. Um, she couldn't care for her own vineyard. And there was another problem that she saw as a problem. And what was the problem that she thought was? She, she, she was darkened by the sun. You know, so she's been outside. Now, back in that day, in ancient times, beauty was to be more pale skin than dark skin. I realize we're talking about Middle Easterners who are dark skin anyway, but my point is that, that it's more beautiful to be considered at that time to be more pale. So she would not consider herself to be as lovely as perhaps somebody who's been able to live indoors most of their life at that time. So she looks at herself in kind of a negative way, um, and she couldn't care for her own vineyard, as it were. So she meets Solomon. So here, there again, think of the situation. Solomon did have vineyards and flocks in Shunem, and it appears that because of her situation that she's been thrown out to work the, uh, the vineyards and flocks, oh, there's this, there's the king. The king, remember the king had tons of flocks. He had lots of vineyards and it appears that she kind of comes in contact with the king. And some, so if she, this hadn't happened, she might not have met the king. I mean, humanly speaking, right? So she, she meets the king and, and it's kind of subtle there, isn't it? Um, so where do you pass your flock? Does that sound like a question a gal would ask a guy she's interested in? Yeah. So, you know, where do you work? Yeah. So women are kind of good at that subtle stuff when they're interested. Although us guys sometimes we're, you know, you got to hit us in the head with a two by four sometimes, right? So where do you pasture your flock? Oh, well, um, it appears that Solomon reciprocates. Um, verse one or chapter one, verse eight. If you yourself do not know most beautiful among women, I don't know if he actually addressed her like that or if he thought that, you know, it, that'd be kind of forward, wouldn't it? Um, Go forth on the trail of the flock and pasture your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. To me, my darling, you are like my mare among the chariots of Pharaoh. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your string, your neck with strings of beads. So like I said, I'm not sure if he vocalizes this, but he is just happy as can be to let her know what's well, right over here. So feel free to come around. And he also admires her beauty. Um, so looking back at verses 5 and 6, we saw that she did view herself as somewhat lovely, but she viewed herself as kind of spoiled. She has this darkened skin, so she would not necessarily imagine Solomon, who is the king, who could have his pick of anybody, that he would be interested in her. Now here's a question, and this is for us guys. Do women usually acknowledge their beauty when we honestly tell them? Thank you for being honest. <laughs> it's all really quiet. Come on, guys, you know, work with me. No, right? I mean, I've, I've been working for 45 years telling Linda, 
she's gorgeous, and she's looking down, not paying attention to me, and she doesn't believe me. Uh, you know, and why don't women believe us when we tell them that? Are we lying? No, say no. <laughs> Come on, guys. Uh, this is this. <laughs> This is meant to help us out, not hurt us, except for Mark, who has a big comfy couch, apparently. <laughs> why don't they? Why, why don't they acknowledge it? Huh? Modesty, perhaps? Women have a really hard... Oh, go ahead, Bill. Right. Good. You know, this has got to be one of the, one of the uh, results of the fall, where women never feel adequate. They always see someone prettier than her, and, and they always think, well, I don't know what they always think, but it, the, the impression I get is they always don't feel like they are as attractive as they are to us. So it's a hard time for them. Uh, and, and so here we have Solomon. We don't know if he expressly said these words to her or whether he thought these words, but she's a knockout to him. Go ahead, Bill. True, yeah. <clears throat> oh, good point. Hmm. Hmm. That's a good point, right? You know, you've seen, um, you, you hear things sometimes where people are critical of somebody who wore this at, at the Academy Awards or this, that. I mean, you go, who cares? But people can be vicious, and women can be vicious. Go ahead, see. You. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yes. Yes, that's a good point. You're exactly right. Good. Thanks for bringing me back to center. <laughs> Peggy. Oh. Okay, sometimes people that are trying to use you or manip manipulate you might use those words and you feel used like, well, obviously it's not true, you know. Good. Good point, everybody. Appreciate that. Um, chapter 1, verse 15. How beautiful you are. This is the bridegroom, Solomon. How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves. And then the bride. How handsome you are, my beloved. And so handsome. Indeed, our couch is luxurious. So both are attracted physically to each other. Both are attracted physically to each other. Now, the attraction is accentuated by what, what they sometimes call as the love hormones. And there can be kind of a halo effect, which can be a problem. What kind of problem can that be? When you, and this can be for a guy or a gal. Say it again. I think it's called phenylethylamine. It's actually a, a substance that can be in relationships that can last for months up to a couple of years. And it causes that rose tinted glasses where you're, and you're not really seeing completely clearly. Right. So the love hormones <laughs> that Pamela can say, and I'm not even going to try. Right. It, it, it affects you. It is something that's, that's manufactured when you fall in love with somebody, and it does affect your outlook. She mentioned the rose-colored glasses thing. You tend to look at each other with rose-colored glasses. How is that a problem? Bree? Bree? You might not see that, what they're actually like or see them wrong. Good. Um, did you have something, Brian? It's not reality. Melissa?
Okay, excellent. Pamela. <clears throat> Okay, good. Mark? Man, that's so true. And that's kind of what I'm looking at too. This is where it's really a problem, is when this person's so enamored and family members are coming to that person, good friends are coming and said, you know, you realize that this person is X, Y, Z, right? You realize why this person's not a good fit? Oh, you know, no, they're, they're in love, and no, oh, no, you don't, you don't know him like I know him. True, I don't, I know him better, maybe, yeah, you know. Um, <clears throat> there, I, I, I can think of two or three instances where I went to my, one of my daughters, you know, six daughters, and said, this guy is bad news. Oh, no, no, really. He's bad news, and here's why. I remember one time, one guy, was, he was really interested in one of my daughters, and I noticed right off the bat, the guy would never look me in the eye. Ever. When I talked to him, he'd be looking down or looking somewhere else. I'm saying to myself, that's not a good sign. And so I told her, this guy has got to go. Yeah, I don't want you to spend time with this guy. You know, he has, he has ulterior motives. Eventually, she did, you know, did agree, but there again, uh, it can be challenging because we've got those rose-colored glasses. We have this emotions that makes us feel good. Oh, this is the person. Why doesn't everybody in my family agree? Why doesn't anybody in my family agree? Yeah, and so for you younger people who are, might be approaching this in the future, keep that in mind. If your folks, if your other siblings come to you and say, this person is bad news, you need to step back and say, maybe they're bad news. Maybe, maybe they are, because your parents, allow, they're not wanting to crush you with your relationships. They want, like God wants, you to have a relationship in which you are extremely, humanly speaking, as happy as can be, right? Where it's be productive and be godly. That's what we want. And so if we're saying something, it's not because we want to make you mad at us or ruin your life. We want you to have a great life. Go ahead, Melissa. It's really funny. <clears throat> Nice. <laughs> Already been resolved. Good. Excellent. Good, good, good. All right. Chapter 2, verse 8. And this is the um, bride talking. Listen, my beloved, behold, he is coming, climbing on the mountains, leaping on the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young, young stag. Okay, so um, Solomon's physical strength is praised here. He's praised for his physical strength. Undoubtedly, he's in his prime, almost 66. And <laughs> that's for you, Craig. Uh, almost in his prime and full of strength and vigor and everything. And what guy can resist being called a gazelle or young stag by your wife, right? Wives, try that out sometimes. See what... See the result, okay? But don't mention my name, okay? <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 10. My beloved responded and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. For behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers have already appeared in the land. The time has arrived for pruning the vines, and the voice of the turtle dove has been heard in our land. The fig tree has ripened its figs, and the vines in blossom have given forth their fragrance. Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. So we're looking at a sharing of events and happenings. Like lovers of all ages, they want to share time together and experiences together. It seems that it's springtime, like now, and, and Solomon's suggesting they go on a hike at Mount Si, or somewhere like that, right? Some place where you're going to see the beauty of the hillsides and etc., now, she is probably a person of the country. Remember, she grew up, or at least was working in Shunem, 
which would have been in the country. And Solomon is a city dweller. So this is Solomon speaking. So he's like, oh, you know, he, he perhaps appreciates the country a little bit more. And he wants to experience more of this country with her. Continuing on down to verse 15. <clears throat> and I believe this... Yeah. Catch the little foxes, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that are ruining the vineyards while our vineyards are in blossom. So there again, it's still spring. Now, the little foxes here can be looked at physically and metaphorically. Now, physically, one of the commentators suggested this might have been one of her jobs as, you know, working in the vineyards, that she was to catch foxes or, or animals that would come and perhaps, you know, uh, steal grapes or whatever. So that might have been one of her jobs. But of course, we're talking metaphorically here. Um, what might this little fox's reference refer to? Catch the little foxes that, that are ruining the vineyards. Any thoughts? Aaron. Good. So something that may seem small at first, and yet it, it kind of jabs you a little bit, and then something else jabs you, and something else jabs you, and something else jabs you, and, and what happens is you're kind of seeing a buildup of tension, a buildup of, I don't want to say anger, but maybe frustration might be a better word. <clears throat> anger is the end result of it, but, but frustration. Um, so Linda and I, we went to a, a seminar many years ago, and, and the teacher of the seminar likened this to like building, you know, bricks. And so every time that there's a situation like this, it's like putting a brick between you and your spouse, and more bricks, more bricks, more bricks, and pretty soon you have this insurmountable wall of things. And the idea is to, to capture, to get rid of these foxes early. So the question is, how are they dealt with in Ephesians 4? 26 says this, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. We should resolve issues quickly when, while they're small rather than allowing them to build onto each other and to create this huge insurmountable wall. Usually in the beginning it's just a matter of you know, a suggestion. You know dear, I'd appreciate if you leave the toilet seat down just one of many that I've heard that women have said, you know, or what it, that you'd put this or that, you know, okay, great, I'm, I'm glad to do that, you know, versus like, oh, he never or she never does X, Y, Z, because you don't tell her, you know. So the idea is to, to deal with it early. Jen. Oh. Okay, good. Yeah, not necessarily conflict, perhaps, but just preferences and things like that, right? Yeah, yeah. What was it I heard one time? A guy says, uh, my wife, she told me two things the other day. She told me, first of all, I don't listen very well. And I can't remember the second one. We, uh, yeah. Me, we can be distracted, right? I, somebody can be talking to me, and I'm thinking about what I have to do later today, or I'm thinking about, nah, guys, we have to be there, and we have to listen. We have to be willing to even change and adapt. You know? Do you remember Red Green Show, The Man's Prayer? I'm a man, and I can change if I have to. I guess <laughs> that's The Man's Prayer. Yes, I memorized it, right? We need to listen and pay attention. Also, it says, don't let the sun go down on, on your wrath. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean the item has to be dealt with before nightfall. Tried that, doesn't always work, right? So the idea is maybe the other person's not ready to process the information yet. So when it says before nightfall, I don't think it means like you absolutely have to, but the idea is 
don't let it fester, deal with the issue relatively soon. Sound about right to everybody? Okay. Um, let's take a look here in chapter, chapter 3, verse 1. This is, for, for my Bible, it says the bride's troubled dream, and a lot of people think that that's what it was. On my bed, night after night, I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but did not find him. So love sometimes brings troubling worries and dreams. Um, typically, what's the number one fear of a married woman? And I don't mean necessarily you here in the church, but women in general. What's the number one fear that is usually expressed by women? Sarah? Infidelity? Mm, not necessarily, but it can be a part of it. Well, that would be a part of it too. Abandonment, right, which can be caused by infidelity or something else, right? So, so the idea of being abandoned is, has been recognized as, as the number one fear of women, abandonment. And here, this woman right here, in, in chapter 3, verse 1, she's kind of experiencing this idea of, of abandonment as a fear of loss. And it goes on to say she seeks him in the city, but as I said, it's probably viewed as a dream. They're not married yet chronologically. So it could very well be that this is, she's experiencing in dreams what would be a real fear uh, of hers. So we see the marriage actually occurs, chapter 3, verse 6. <clears throat> yes, Jen, go ahead. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Good. Thanks for mentioning that. It can be, it doesn't necessarily have to mean like something like infidelity, but even within the relationship itself, coldness, whatever. Good, good. Thank you. And by the way, if you have something to say and I'm looking down, or please, you know, like do what she did, say my name. You know, Steve. Oh. Ah. That's that's a great point, Steve. That's that's going back to what you said in the beginning. You know, establishing the framework in the beginning, and that helps to to ward this off of it. That's good. 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 All right. Um, Chapter 3, verse 6. What is this coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all scented powders of the merchant? Behold, it is the traveling couch of Solomon, sixty mighty men around it, of the mighty men of Israel. All of them are wielders of the sword, expert in war. Each man has his sword at his side, guarding against the terrors of the night. King Solomon has made for himself a sedan chair from the timber of Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, and its seat of purple fabric, with its interior lovingly fitted out by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and gaze on King Solomon with the crown with which his mother has crowned him on the day of his wedding and on the day of his gladness of heart. So that we see the wedding entourage approaches. Um, what things, what things uh, appeal to her senses as she sees that approach? What things does she refer to? Smoke, okay. Smell, okay. Lots of incense. Okay, so there's incenses burning. When I say smoke, I mean, back at that time, when you see smoke on the horizon, it may not be smoke. It may be people that are approaching because it's kicking up dust from the horses, etc. cetera. Bree? Expensive fabric, right. He's sitting on expensive fabric, right. What else does she see? What's his, what's his emotion? Gladness. He is delighted. He's wearing a portable crown. I don't think it's the official crown necessarily, but he's wearing a crown that his mother gave him for this wedding day. What's his mother's name again? Bathsheba. Exactly right. Bill, go ahead. Yes. Yeah.
Yeah, good. <clears throat> yes. Nice, very good. And, and also, back in the day, there were no synagogues. Remember, the synagogues actually were, were founded during the exile. So how did people get married? Well, back in that day, it would be common to get married in a house or even maybe out in a, in a field or, or, or a um, garden or something. That would be very common. So that's probably what you're seeing right here. You're seeing it's either going to be an indoor marriage or outdoor marriage, more than likely. And it's really a big deal. In chapter 4, we see Solomon talking to his bride. How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful you are. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats that have descended from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewes which have come up from their washing, all which bear twins. And skip down to verse 7. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. <clears throat> there is a there was a uh, video one time out, and it's called, the video is called Hubby Vision. Has anyone heard of it? Hubby Vision. Okay, what that is is a pair of goggles a woman can buy. If she puts them on, she sees the world as her husband sees it. So here's this overflowing trash can. She takes the Hubby Vision, puts on the trash can, is empty. There's no dishes in the sink. There are no socks on the floor, right? And someone suggested she should take that and look in the mirror and she will see herself as drop dead gorgeous because ladies that's how we see our wives drop dead gorgeous that's our hubby vision so yes we're neglectful we absent-minded but there's one thing we know for sure and that's it Aaron go ahead <laughs> male genetic dirt blindness <laughs> so it's actual syndrome. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's good. All right. Well, anyway, hubby vision. She's drop dead gorgeous. Chapter five, verse two. We see them broadening in love. The marriage has occurred, and there's broadening. There are things that happen. Chapter five, verse two. I was asleep, but my heart was awake. This is she talking. A voice. My beloved was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is drenched with dew, my locks with the damp of the night. I have taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I dirty them again? Okay, so the thought here is maybe there's a possible separation or disagreement going on here. Okay, because her door is locked and she's not real excited about opening up the door. Now, she's using the excuse about the dress, et cetera, et cetera, but she doesn't seem real excited about opening the door. So um, it could very well be that that's the case. And uh, in verse 6, I opened, so she finally opens the door, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and had gone. My heart went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him, but I did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer me. The watchman who made the rounds in the city found me. They struck me and wounded me. The guardsmen of the walls took away my shawl from me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, as to what you'll tell him, for I am lovesick. So there again, she finally does go to the door, now he's gone. Now this actually could be looked at as a situation today. It could be looked at to where there's a disagreement. Something's happened. He storms out. He seeks to come back. He doesn't come back. You know, back and forth, and suddenly he takes off or something. We've seen those things happen. So it's a very possible thing that this is what's going on here. There again, we're talking about marriage and things happen in marriage sometimes. Chapter 6, verse 1. Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? My beloved has gone down into his garden, to the beds of balsam, to pasture his flock in the gardens, and gather lilies, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine, he who pastures his flock among the lilies. So it seems that Solomon's back with the flocks and his gardens. So if there was a spat, if he did decide to take some cooling off time, he might have gone right back to where they started, he and her, back down to Shunem, the gardens, etc., for kind of a cooling off period. And it appears that she may have gone there to join him in, in verse 4. 
You are as beautiful, he's talking, you are as beautiful as Tirzah, my darling, as lovely as Jerusalem, as awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have confused me. So you see Solomon's Twitter pated. Does anyone remember where that word comes from? Twitter pated? Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. It's, um, yeah, what's the name of that deer again? Bambi, thank you. Yeah, Bambi, yeah, Twitter pated. Uh, actually, the rabbit was. Uh, he's hard, he finds it hard to think straight because of her beauty. He actually gets befuddled. As everyone knows, sometimes your tongue gets kind of sick when you're talking to, you know, somebody like, you know, like my wife or whatever initially. Hi, hey, how you doing? I always talk like this. <laughs> you know, the tongue swells and, and then again you say stupid things, right? <clears throat> in verse 8 of chapter 6, there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and maidens without number, but my dove, the perfect one, is unique. She is her mother's only daughter. She is the pure child of the one who bore her. The maidens saw her and called her blessed. The queens and the concubines also, and they praised her. So they praised her. So, so we see the bride is praised by the competition, right? We're talking about other brides and other concubines, and she is coming in. Now, would you expect her to be praised by them? Who's this, right? We were here first, and no, you, you wouldn't expect that. So that says something's very unique about her, that, that even they are able to find things worth, um, worth praising. So assuming that this separation's occurred, there's a reconciliation, as it were, in chapter 7, verse 10. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go out into the country, and let us spend the night in the villages. Let us arise early and go to the vineyards, and let us see whether the vine is budded, and the blossoms have opened. So he's proposing a trip to Leavenworth. Maybe the earlier spat has been resolved, and they want to get back together again. They want to make things happen. So there again, that's very well what may have occurred. And chapter 8, verse 5. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Beneath the apple tree I awakened you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she was in labor and gave you, gave you birth. Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as severe as Sheol. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. I'd like to spend a lot more time on these verses, but we can't, looking at the clock. But one of the things that occurs is a sharing of history. He talks about here where she was born. Sounds like she was perhaps born outside. So one of the things when, when you're going into a courtship, you share each other's histories. You start telling each other what, what it was like when you were growing up, what your situation was, where you lived, etc. So you, you exchange this historical information because that's how you get to know each other and appreciate each other all the more. She talks about setting a seal over his heart. A seal represents ownership, as it were. So she wants, she wants her to be the seal on his heart, the number one, which is going to be a problem because he's got a bunch of queens and concubines already, right? But she's wanting to be the number one for him. It says love is actually stronger than death. Is that true? Is that true that love is stronger than death? And say it again. It continues after death. And I was thinking in the church with Jesus. I mean, his love was stronger than death. He was willing to go through what he went through for me and for you. Um, for us as husbands, there are not too many husbands that won't step in front of their wives and take the hit to prevent her from getting it. You know, because they, they value protecting her more than his own life. Love is stronger than death. Bill, go ahead.
Wow, that's, that's great, Bill. I, my mind is wandering because I remember when, when Linda was pregnant with, her second, with our second child, Justin, and I remember she and I talking, and she was actually in tears a couple of times. I'm not sure if I can love another child as much as I love this child that she already had. And what she found is what Bill's alluding to, the love multiplies. And she keeps on loving these children as they come. Go ahead, Bill. <clears throat> It is. It is. It's hard. Yes, it is. Good. Good point. Um, so we need to move on along there. Um, love is stronger than death. We're going to, we were going to talk about jealousy a bit, but we're not. Um, in chapter 8, verse 11, Solomon had a vineyard in Baal Hammon. He entrusted the vineyard to caretakers. Each one was to bring a thousand shekels of silver for its fruit. My own, this is the bride talking, my very own vineyard is at my disposal. The thousand shekels are for you, Solomon, and two hundred are for those who take care of its fruit. One thing that occurred to me as I'm reading this, how, how much value does that, does that vineyard have to Solomon? Nothing. It's really a drop in the bucket, but what made it valuable is the fact that she offers it to him freely. The thought that occurred to me is, you know, here in the church, God needs me like I need a third eye. Well, I should have had a third eye raising my kids, but God doesn't need me at all. In fact, if anything, I'm probably more of a hindrance than a help sometimes. But when we offer the Lord service, when we offer to the Lord to serve him, it's just like this woman offering to Solomon what little she had. Yes, it's little, but to him, it's amazingly valuable. You think about the widow and the two mites. Jesus says, she gave me more than all the rest of the people. We offer what we have, and God takes that and he goes, that is amazing. And it delights him, and it pleases him, which is why I think you know, service is such an important thing in the church, whatever we do. We're, you're actually offering a love gift back to God. You don't have to do it. But you want to do it because I want to please God. That's the way God's designed. You know, that's the way we're supposed to reciprocate, not to gain favor. If we know Jesus, we have all the favor we need. It's to, it's to bless God, to be pleasing to him with what we offer. Any final, any final uh, observations or things before I go into too much more overtime? All right, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the book, Song of Solomon. It is a, a book, Lord, which talks about your delight and design of married love. Father, I pray that you would help us wherever we are in our walk, whether we have been married for many years, newly married, not married. Help us, Father, to seek to embrace your standards and commit ourselves to walking with you the way that you want, because that is good, because you love us and want only the best for us. Lord, please be with Pastor Jason. May he preach your word, Father, with power, conviction, and passion. I pray for Joseph and the worship team, Father. May they open, open our hearts and worship to you to hear your word. And thank you for our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Dave will be teaching next week because I'm going to be out looking for the five-pound nugget. I'm going to get it this time. This time.